In case you're wondering and are distracted, yes, this is a Howard the Duck Funko Pop. It is the only Funko Pop I do or ever will own because he is my grumpy duck son and I love him very much. Okay, let's talk about the Not Like Other Princesses book. All right, I read Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reed. And I know a lot of people like this book. I have a lot of thoughts about it. I need to take notes on this. Oh, I did! Huh. I better start with the plot of this book so I can do my ranting later, and I'll try and keep it as snark-free as possible, although I don't think that's going to happen. So Dealing with Dragons is about a princess named Simmerine who doesn't want to be a princess because it involves a lot of things that she doesn't like. She feels very restricted in her life. She Every time she tries to start a new lesson, her father the king shuts it down. He's never named, he's just the king. So she, at the suggestion of, of a toad, decides to run away and become the princess captive voluntarily of a dragon. And she is chosen as the uh, princess for... Oh, I forgot her name, I feel so bad. Kazool. Kazool, my wife. Best character in this entire book. Um, this female dragon named Kazool, who's amazing, take no shit. I love Kazool. And Simmerine is really happy living with her because she gets to do all kinds of cool things and uh, live with a dragon, which I, you know, I think a lot of us uh, female fantasy fans would agree dragons are pretty awesome. And she cooks for her and organizes her hoard. But there's one hitch in the plan in that um, several princes, along with the one that Serene was betrothed to, keep trying to come and rescue her. And she insists that she doesn't want to be rescued and tries to drive them off. She puts up some signs that would hopefully drive these young knights away. And then also she is annoyed by this smarmy mansplaining wizard who is just making sure she's okay. It's a poor young woman all alone in a dragon's cave. And he um, is the head wizard, I think. And there's this agreement between dragons and wizards where wizards can enter certain parts of the dragon kingdom and um, they won't attack the dragons, I think. And that uh, causes problems later. So there's this other dragon in um, Kazool's kind of like circle of friends that um, doesn't like Simmerine and he's causing a lot of problems. And it turns out that he wants to be king of the dragons and uh, the wizards help him rig the uh, dragon king competition. And I think he also killed the other king dragon. Um, Oh, and the really cool thing about dragons is that the title of king can go to someone of either gender. So in the end, Kazool, surprise, surprise, gets chosen to be um, dragon king, and I love her so much. Along the way, Simmerine makes friends with um, Alianora, another princess who's being held captive by the evil dragon. And uh, she discovers this um, young man who was turned to stone in a quest. Um, I think he's like the second son and he expects his younger brother to come and save him, or something like that. Like, you know, he's playing with a lot of fantasy tropes. And everything turns out alright. There's a really cool witch lady named Morwen, um, and there's a lot of great female friendships in this book, which I think is one of my favorite parts about it. Unfortunately, one of the tropes that it plays with has been... I think it's from a scene that's been well played out by this point, and it's one that I was annoyed by pretty much ever since I started the genre. Um, is that these girls who are princesses don't want to be princesses and they run away because, oh, I'm only expected to do needlepoint. It's like, first of all, needlepoint's awesome. I love cross-stitch. Second of all, it's very second-wave feminism of like, oh, I'm going to reject all girly things because I'm cool like that. And uh, third of all, I'm pretty sure princesses were trained to like be able to host important people of state and, you know, know a lot of diplomacy and history. But that never comes up with these princesses because they're only taught needlepoint for some reason. And while, of course, they're being trained to be a good wife and that's very gendered, I think historically princesses had a lot more to do. And it also comes across, as I was reading, um, one person online pointed out, as very 
privileged and complaining about privilege. It's like, you're the richest person in the entire kingdom, you're pampered, you have all these servants looking after you, you've never had to work a hard day in your life, and yet you're like, no, I want to work a hard day. Like, give it to me. It's like, no, you don't, sweetie. You just want to stay in your castle and have your food brought to you. That's what you really want. I called this in my notes the Ur rebellious princess trope, and I remember complaining about this to my friend on the bus one day in, like, middle school, because I was so tired of the rebellious princess trope by then. I wanted a story where the princess has to use, like, her skills of diplomacy to, like, stop a war or something and do really cool princess shit, and also, like, She's in an arranged marriage, but she and her husband are great friends and they work well together, even if they don't actually love each other. But I did not get that in this book. I complained about this in my last review for Green Rider, and it's that this is another European-based fantasy, and it's in a fantasy world. But Cimmerian learns Latin at one point? It's like, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. You can't have all these made-up fantasy kingdoms that are in another world, and you're like, oh, it's not Europe, it's another world, and then say she's learning Latin? Like, that language is from Earth, bitch! I know you're on Earth now because you said you were learning Latin! Like, even in this world, it's called, like, Latinium. Oh, shoot, I mentioned this world again. Sorry, I will try not to do that. Once again, no people of color, except for a genie that gets summoned, so... Nice. Wait, to, uh, it's like, circa Aladdin 1992, Middle Eastern stereotypes, haha. <laughs> I could see how this book could be really sweet, and I could have really enjoyed it, but another thing that it had was a tone problem, and I think it was Terry Pratchett, whoops, there I go again, who said that there's a difference between writing to children and writing down to children, and I think you can write in pretty much the same way. I mean, adults don't have to read overly complicated books either. You just have to have slightly different subject material. You know, you don't want a lot of rape in a ch child's book, obviously. I don't want to read a lot of rape in an adult book. And you have to present the child character as someone to look up to, or at least that the characters can sympathize with. But I think this book was really towing the line of writing down to readers. It was just very simple language and a little, like, cutesy which is definitely not what it was going for, like, it was trying to be the opposite of that. But there are so many better examples of writing for children that is not writing down to children. And unfortunately, I think this book was, it was like trying to appeal to an older audience and writing for a younger audience, it felt like. Because the kids who are reading this book, you kind of have to have a fantasy toolbox and fantasy knowledge already, because this book feels like it was written for people who are tired of princess stories. Well, you have to be a certain age to be tired of princess stories. Probably like eight, let's say. That's about when I got tired of them. And this book feels like it was written for, like, be, to be read out loud to, like, a seven-year-old, when it should be for, like, a 9, 10, 11 year old, which is unfortunate because I feel like I was reading adult authors when I was like 11. Now, I may be a special case. I read a lot. I read way above my age range, but still kids can tell when they're being written down to. And although this book wasn't overly bad at that, it was enough to be noticeable. Aside from the premise, which is a princess volunteers to be um, living with a dragon, there wasn't anything else original about the setting or the characters. I mean, Kazool, my wife, was really cool. Cimmerine was pretty standard. I mean, even Disney is doing rebellious princesses now. <clears throat> Merida. <clears throat> but the wizards were, like, obviously evil. The evil dragon, obviously evil. They were, like, twirling their mustaches up in here. The female friendships were refreshing, but it was very like, oh, we're in a cave now. Oh, we're in an enchanted forest. I mean, these books are called the Enchanted Forest Chronicles, so I really don't know what to say about that. You could type this or paint in the numbers with your eyes closed. There was not a lot of... I don't want to. I don't want to put the author down, but like, I feel like there wasn't a lot of thought that went into the world building here. Kids, 
eat up world building. You know how much money they make off of companion books to movies where it explains more about the setting? Kids will pour over that shit for hours. I poured over that shit for hours. It's easy to market to that. Again, don't write down to kids. They know when you do it. Uh, this book was very short. It was 212 pages. I don't really have anything else to say about it. Okay, bye. Howard, no.